welcome to lecture series in advanced geotechnical engineering course. So, in this lecture we are commencing with module 7 lecture 1 on geotechnical physical modeling. Nowadays with an increase in the infrastructure development there is a dire need for understanding about behavior of the geotechnical structures before collapse or before failure and at failure. This will enhance to understand the response of these structures before failure and at failure. This module is divided with the following contents physical modeling methods and especially a technique which we are going to expose ourselves is called centrifuge based physical modeling and its relevance to geotechnical engineering with a number of examples. And we will try to see application of this, text, uh, this technique for static and dynamic problems with uh, numerous examples. So, in this module we are going to discuss about what are the different modeling techniques and uh, narrowing down to physical modeling methods and application of this uh, centrifuge modeling and its relevance to geotechnical engineering we will try to bring out that and then with the number of examples and its applications we will actually try to see the centrifuge modeling of geotechnical structures. The basic intention of this module to cover the scaling laws or what we call scaling relationships and modeling considerations for physical modeling in geotechnical engineering both for static and dynamic conditions with examples. As I mentioned earlier geotechnical physical modeling has become a powerful and versatile tool for studying geotechnical problems. A wide number of applications can be studied by using this technique this helps to gain insight into the behavior of geotechnical structures. So, coming to uh, the word which is uh, there in uh, geotechnical centrifuge modeling or geotechnical physical modeling what we said is that modeling the modeling if you look in uh, if you look into the uh, definition it can be defined as a representation of some aspect of real behavior. So, it can be a, a real structure and a situation or a problem that is soil or foundation by a more abstract system if you are able to do that for example you consider an embankment resting on a soil then the all aspects of the embankment need to be modeled and then represented. Similarly, a foundation like a shallow foundation subjected to vertical load horizontal load nowadays people are understanding about the subjected to torsional loads to the shallow foundations. And similarly let us consider a pile foundation subjected to vertical load horizontal load and uh, a torque load these things can uh, you know represented in an abstract system. So, modeling can be defined as representation of some aspect of real behavior a situation or a problem by a more abstract system. So, in modeling it is essential to recognize uh, three fundamentals one is that we need to see all significant influences should be modeled in similarity that means first of all we say that material material to be modeled and configuration let us say an embankment a slope you know of an embankment and height of the embankment and its bedding conditions need to be you know simulated. Similarly all the effects not modeled in similarity should be proven by experimental evidence. So, any you know parameter which is not modeled in similarity should be you know proven by experimental evidence and any unknown effect should be revealed or proven insignificant by means of test results that means that experimental verification will help us to ensure that any unknown effect you know should be revealed or proven insignificant by means of test results. Suppose if we are not able to achieve a similarity between because of in virtue of certain parameter and we have to see that you know this is proven insignificant by means of experimental you know test results. Further 
a model can approximate uh, simplification of reality. So the skill in uh, modeling is to spot the approximate level of uh, simplification uh, to recognize those features which are important and those features which are unimportant. So uh, what we need to know uh, in uh, modeling is that the skill in modeling is to spot the approximate level of simplification and to recognize a parameter those features which are important and not important and uh, you know this can lead to you know more understanding of the behavior of a structure being modeled. So it is often necessary basically for the you know sophisticated design and analysis procedures as in the way of uh, uh, is the only way for the geotechnical engineers can analyze a complex physical system uh, at a fraction of cost of physical or any other type of modeling. So modeling is often necessary in the present sophisticated uh, you know design uh, because of the complexity which is involved uh, you know uh, by modeling by in involving with uh, you know number of parameters. And uh, this can be done at a fraction of cost uh, of physical or any other type of modeling. So what are the steps involved in uh, modeling? First of all selection of problem or system of interest and postulate the principal characteristics of the problem or system in the second step. In the third step apply principles of mechanics like for soils stress strain criterion effective stress principle, Darcy's law, continuity equation, compatibility condition, stress history etc. to deduce the response of the model. So in the third step we will apply the principle of mechanics for uh, you know for soils stress strain relationship and uh, or stress strain criterion and effective stress principle Darcy's law, continuity equation, compatibility condition, stress history etc. Basically this is done to reduce the response of the model. Further comparisons of the predictions with measured values from the carefully conducted in situ or laboratory tests. So comparisons of the predictions with measured values from carefully conducted in situ or laboratory results. So in step 4 if the agreement is not proper go to step 2 to re-examine the postulation and repeat the steps from 2 to 5 that means in step 5 if the agreement uh, is not proper whatever is predicted is not in comparison with uh, uh, you know observed results then go to step 2 re-examine the postulation and uh, repeat steps from 2 to 5. So having discussed the and defined modeling in uh, modeling and uh, in geotechnical engineering modeling word is not new modeling techniques in geotechnical engineering is a conventional approach where uh, you know it is adopted uh, traditionally. So we have different uh, you know categories of uh, modeling we can say that empirical modeling uh, even today uh, because of the complex nature of the soil in many cases we adopt empirical models and uh, theoretical models these are today even, even today they are famous and uh, we are using and numerical models with the advent of uh, you know computers. Uh, the numerical modeling is uh, uh, you know uh, gaining popularity and is also getting uh, you know tuned with uh, advanced techniques in uh, you know modeling techniques which we are going to discuss in this uh, uh, module. And uh, traditionally we have analog models which are uh, you know very popular uh, to, stay, to state an example uh, the spring analogy model adopted by Terzaghi for explaining the effective stress uh, uh, equation uh, stands as an example. And uh, lastly a physical model uh, which is uh, you know nothing but uh, classified as uh, three heads basically one is uh, full scale this is at 1 is to 1 and uh, that means that a construction of a full scale structure. And, uh, if many situations or many places or many uh, sites the feasibility is a question and controlled uh, you know uh, experimentation of a full scale model is uh, uh, next to impossible next to next to possible. In uh, such situation uh, you know then you know small scale model is one of the viable option and uh, these small scale model in the sense the model reduced by n times that means that all the 
you know the dimensions of a full scale uh, model are reduced by n times and this can be done at normal gravity that is at one gravity or at present please take it as that ng that is called a centrifuge based physical model which we are going to introduce in this modules. So the physical model is subclassified as full scale and small scale at normal gravity a small scale at centrifuge model or at high gravities. So uh, why we do we need this small scale models at high gravities in what cases uh, you know these uh, you know techniques are applicable uh, you know that we will be elucidating in this uh, you know uh, part of uh, uh, lectures on in this module. So empirical models a long history of the empirical modeling in geotechnical engineering is there and uh, we have uh, wage strength uh, criterion in the wage strength criterion. Uh, considering uh, you know number of uh, cases of embankment failures Jerome in 1973 recommended a correction factor lambda uh, for a uh, vane shear strength measured in the field. With that it has been found that with an increase in plasticity index of the soil the correction factor lambda is going to uh, decrease uh, drastically. So that means that uh, you know by applying this correction factor uh, to the uh, to, to the measured value then you know we can actually get the uh, correct strength, correct strength, strength value which can be adopted in the design based on that this can be you know matched close to the field observations. So an empirical model was developed basically uh, by considering the observations which are actually done in during the vein strength test particularly when the vein blade is rotating the surrounding soil is subjected to some sort of disturbance and that leads to you know to give the higher value of uh, you know the vein, vein strength or shear strength value. So in lieu of that and uh, this is actually predominant when with an increase in the plasticity index. So uh, you know a correction factor has been recommended for this uh, you know vein strength uh, correction factor or even today it is uh, known as uh, Zurum's uh, correction factor for uh, vein shear strength measured in the field. Similarly we have consult for uh, you know estimating consolidation settlement and we have uh, examples like CPT and uh, settlement of footings on sand and, uh, and for interpreting pressure meter test results pressure meter is an, a device uh, wherein uh, we can actually measure the in situ modulus of the soil uh, you know uh, in the during in a by placing an inflated uh, rubber membrane in the balloon. So depending upon the you know the uh, you know the intactness and softness or hardness of the uh, you know walls of the borehole the response of the test can be achieved. So here there is also some empiricism and empirical models exist they do exist and uh, we use in uh, in the practice of geotechnical engineering. Theoretical model uh, even uh, today uh, like for example a classical example for theoretical model is for studying uh, steady state seepage uh, conditions uh, for uh, Laplace equations is one possible theoretical model. So once a theoretical model has been uh, formulated there are two possibilities for its application either the boundary conditions of the problem can be massaged, massaged in such a way that exact analytical result can be obtained or a numerical solution is required. So uh, one of the uh, you know examples which we can state is what steady state seepage conditions and uh, this is uh, uh, can be defined by Laplace equation. The steady flow of an incompressible fluid through a porous medium is governed by a familiar partial differential equation called dou square h by dou x square plus dou square h by dou y square plus dou square h by dou z square is equal to 0. So wherein uh, you know this uh, head is the h is the head drop and uh, this if it this is in three dimensional uh, direction and this is uh, deduced based on, the, based on the continuity equation and uh, if you have say uh, you know uh, only two dimensional uh, condition then uh, the third term which is dou square h by dou z square is equal to 0. So in that case dou square h by dou x square plus dou square h by dou y square is equal to 0 that is for 2D uh, seepage condition. If we are having let us say uh, only one, di one dimensional flow like uh, in the constant head perimeter for example wherein 
we can actually have dou square a dou square h by dou x square is equal to 0. So, one dimensional flow wherein we have you know dou square h by dou x square is equal to 0, but two dimensional flow of an embankment flow of an water through an embankment or earthen dam which is dou square h by dou x square plus dou square h by dou y square is equal to 0. And for the three dimensional flow an example is you know flow of water into the well that is the three dimensional flow and this approximate change in parameter also describes the flow of current as well as the flow of heat. So, the if you look into the analogous you know you know representation of these theories we can say that this is used in you know in study in flow of current as well as the flow of the heat that is the heat electrical analogy as well as in the heat transfer. Coming to the next you know set of modeling which we have said is numerical modeling and numerical or constitutive modeling. Basically a numerical or a constitutive model is governed by the equations which ultimately describes the link between the changes in strain that is delta epsilon and delta sigma that is in changes in the strain and changes in stress for any element of the soil because of you know the loading which they are subjected to. The complexity in numerical model increases with the requirement of defining several material parameters from laboratory and institute tests. So, what will happen is that the complexity and the you know the efficiency of the numerical model increases efficiency of the model becomes difficult with the requirement of defining several material properties from laboratory and institute tests. Moreover, in a numerical model if you are actually having several materials with interacting with each other very difficult to you know define the stress strain relationship between uh, those materials which are actually uh, you know taking part in the behavior. So, uh, this particular uh, technique uh, even though lot of progress actually has been made uh, many uh, times actually this requires verification of the developed numerical solution if this is this is done if the by using an appropriate technique if this validation is done yes numerical modeling can be considered as one of the viable option for you know you know studying number of geotechnical problems. So, numerical modeling is the subject of many basic and applied research efforts in civil engineering and basically such efforts involve the use of finite difference and finite element and boundary element and are discrete elements in conjunction with sophisticated nonlinear elastic elastoplastic or visco plastic models. So, uh, what we are discussing is that uh, this requires verifications of the developed numerical simulation once the numerical model is verified then the confidence in using this model uh, increases. So, these efforts uh, basically doing this numerical modeling involve the use of uh, you know methods like finite difference method, finite element methods, boundary element method and discrete element methods in conjunction with sophisticated uh, you know models like nonlinear elastic elastoplastic and viscoplastic models uh, we have said that uh, traditionally in geotechnical engineering these analog models are uh, famous the analog models basically the analog model uh, carries a resemblarity uh, in which a law which model follows is analogous to the law which the real situation or problem uh, follows see uh, let us consider uh, electrical analogy flow of water. So, this you know can be given with defined with two laws one is you know in case of real situation let us say that is Darcy's law wherein we can actually define Q that is discharge is equal to Q K that is the coefficient of permeability and I that is hydraulic gradient and A area of cross section. So, area of cross section through which the flow is actually happening where I is nothing but h by l. Similarly, in case of electrical analogy when the flow of current when we are actually considering we have Holmes law where it defines you know the you know between using the resistivity and a potential drop over a certain length and you know the cross section area of the conductor through which this electricity is passing. So, there is you know this analog model resembles with a law which model follows is analogous to the law which real situation or the problem follows. So, this particular concept was you know extended to you know for explaining the Terzaghi's principle of effective stress that is this spring analogy model. 
in the spring energy model uh, what has been considered is that the we have in the real situation we have uh, soil particles and uh, occupied by the voids in between uh, soil particles occupied by water and when it is subjected to loading uh, then what we have is that you have a situation that uh, you know the skeleton the soil skeleton as well as the water surrounding the voids as well as uh, the surrounding the particles is subjected to loading. So this was actually represented uh, by a spring analogy problem so wherein what has been considered is that a, a cylinder of certain diameter was considered and it is actually having a piston arrangement at the top and uh, let us assume that it actually has got a wall which is actually possible to close or open then the piston which can move up and downwards and uh, let us assume that the bottom of the piston is attached with a spring having a certain uh, uh, stiffness k and uh, and let us see that the the spring actually represents the uh, soil skeleton and uh, pore water is actually represented by water in the analogy model spring analogy model also and uh, let us assume that the uh, you know the piston is uh, placed in position and uh, uh, the valve is actually closed and the load is placed a load of P is applied on the uh, piston. So then when the valve is closed initially what will happen is that the entire uh, load is actually bound by the uh, spring. So that means that uh, under unrained conditions also similar uh, situation happens similar phenomenon happens in real situation wherein uh, entire uh, lo uh, you know load is actually bound by the pore water. The moment uh, the valve is uh, open, uh, then there is uh, a possibility for the spring to undergo compression. So, in a way, what will happen now is that the load is apportioned by uh, you know sp uh, the spring, which is nothing but a soil skeleton in the real situation, and uh, pore water. So, based on this, uh, after certain uh, amount of time, what will happen is that the hydrostatic conditions uh, will uh, prevail. And in a process what will happen is that we can say that the total stress is equal to effective stress plus uh, uh, pore water pressure. So to explain this uh, effective stress equation uh, sigma is equal to sigma dash plus uw this spring analogy was used and further the concept was actually extended for explaining the secondary consolidation that means under a constant effective stress when there is actually change in uh, you know the void ratio which actually happens over a period of time because of the certain nature of soils like peat or marshy from the marshy lands or uh, we have uh, you know the man made material like municipal solid waste it undergoes uh, you know huge amounts of uh, secondary consolidation. So this spring and dash plot analogy was actually used to represent uh, you know these uh, uh, you know particular phenomenon of uh, secondary consolidation or a creep of a soil. Uh, before explaining uh, that let us uh, try to look into extension of this spring analogy model uh, you know previously we have said that for explaining the total uh, total stress is equal to effective stress plus pore water pressure we actually have used a single spring but uh, in order to explain the consolidation behavior of a soil layer having uh, you know two open or two sand layers sand layers at top and bottom where they are actually having high permeability at the top and let us assume that this is the water table at which uh, the uh, you know the saturation below the uh, soil is completely saturated and it is subjected to say certain uh, increase in the load say delta sigma. So this situation is actually uh, you know uh, can be modeled analogous in an analogous way uh, by using uh, spring analogy model. So here what we have done is that we have taken a, a long uh, uh, cylinder and uh, the, the cylinder is assumed to be filled with water and has got top and bottom uh, two uh, walls and the diameter of the walls rep uh, represent the uh, you know the permeability of the soil if it is uh, you know large permeability the diameter is high and if it is small uh, permeability the diameter is uh, small and uh, this is a piston which is mobile and uh, each uh, at each compartment it is divided into here it's shown as five compartments 1 2 3 4 5 and between each compartments uh, there is a spring of st uh, stiffness k is attached and another spring of k is attached here another spring of k is attached here and fourth spring and fifth spring 
and all these compartments are interconnected so that means that water can flow uh, you know uh, in its uh, in the, uh, freely. Now what will happen is that initially uh, when we actually apply delta sigma so we have a situation that if delta sigma is applied uh, you know then the pore water pressure uh, which is within the soil is nothing but uh, delta u uh, which is uh, you know uh, the uh, what we can say is the first isochrone which actually gets developed and over a period of uh, time let us say at time t is equal to 0 uh, and uh, when, when time uh, t is equal to 0 when the load is applied then we can say that uh, you know the first isochrone is, uh, is nothing but delta u uh, it uh, shifts by uh, equivalent to delta sigma then or uh, just let us say that when time t1 where t1 is actually greater than t then what will happen is that uh, because of the previous nature of uh, you know uh, this uh, uh, two layers uh, open layers here sand and uh, at bottom top and bottom that what will happen is that uh, you know the uh, the, the water uh, transfers the stress directly uh, to the soil and the pore water pressure drops to 0 that means that uh, at this particular point the next level uh, the isochrone uh, comes towards the uh, you know origin the center uh, from where the pore water pressure increased to delta u or delta is equal to delta sigma so at both top and bottom it actually gets uh, uh, you know uh, to reduce to 0 then correspondingly what will happen still at the midpoint there will be uh, high amount of uh, pressure uh, pore water pressure had to be dissipated or transferred to the uh, the effect uh, uh, transfer to the soil skeleton so here uh, what happens is that over a period of time what will happen the the tendency of uh, uh, you know the isochrone uh, to flow towards uh, uh, towards the uh, you know the uh, initial condition tends to prevail that is the initial condition is nothing but the original hydrostatic condition before the application of the load so here uh, the similar situation can be simulated or uh, with the if we are able to say open these walls simultaneously both upper wall and bottom wall then uh, in line with uh, you know what actually happened with uh, uh, two open layers which we consider in the left hand side of this figure we have the spring 1 and 5 will get compressed first then spring 2 and 4 will get compressed first and finally the third spring will start compressing slowly. So this process continues till uh, you know the hydrostatic conditions prevail uh, in, the, uh, in the situation. So here with this uh, what we can actually explain is that the consolidation phenomenon of a, a soil having a thickness uh, h uh, clay layer having thickness h can be represented by a spring analogy model with uh, multiple springs attached in, uh, uh, in uh, the fashion which is actually shown in the figure. And uh, as we have said that uh, this analogy model was actually applied to uh, you know to secondary consolidation or the creep of a soil also and uh, two models which are uh, can be discussed are that Gibson and Lowe 1961 and Barden 1965. So here um, this uh, model uh, modeled by modifying the soil skeletal uh, response with the time. So the soil skeletal particularly what will happen is that under the application of a constant effective stress uh, the uh, because of the breakage of the soil particles or bending and uh, breakage of the soil particles this phenomenon actually happens. So here uh, this is represented by Gibson and Lowe in 1961 by a linear spring uh, between uh, um, uh, linear spring A1 here and the linear spring, spring B1 and linear dash part uh, delta 1 and uh, uh, so this is actually represented and further this was actually modified by Barden in 1965 by replacing this linear spring and uh, by putting a linear spring here and here what actually has been modified is that instead of linear dash part a non-linear dash part has been used to go close to the you know the creep or a secondary consolidation phenomenon in the real situation. So in this way the analog models were uh, traditionally applied and uh, uh, particularly uh, to understand about the electrical analogy and uh, the spring analogy uh, they are uh, famous in as far as uh, you know uh, geotechnical engineering is concerned. Coming to the fourth uh, you know type of um, uh, the, uh, the last type of modeling which we have discussed is uh, nothing but physical models. These physical models are basically performed in order to study the particular as aspects of the uh, 
behavior of the prototypes and these physical models help to you know postulate or you know portray the failure mechanisms and to understand about the behavior of a prototype before failure and at failure and full scale testing is in a way example of physical modeling where all features of the prototype are full scale structure in field being you know studied and are reproduced at physical at full scale one is to one that means that all aspects are actually you know represented and that means that you have real soil real ground condition and real ground motion and real loading and when you have this situation then full scale testing is in a way of example of physical modeling where all features of the prototype are full scale structure in field being studied or reproduced it at full scale. This full scale testing is also quite common in geotechnical engineering practice like example like a plate load test which is actually conducted to you know estimate the bearing capacity that means that from the through a field plate load test we can actually carry carried out carry out in the, the plate load test can be carried out in the at the site to get the bearing capacity. Similarly uh, in order to get the uh, you know axial load capacity or lateral load capacity uh, there is a mandatory requirement of uh, testing of uh, piles which are actually you being used in a uh, project uh, for uh, uh, you know we actually do the two categories of pile load testing one is to uh, test up to the failure the other is uh, to uh, you know uh, test only up to uh, certain amount uh, certain times of design load so that you know these piles can be used in the uh, structure. So the one which is actually applied beyond the design load is uh, you know generally done initially uh, as a uh, you know a test where uh, you know the piles can be abundant. So these uh, full scale testing is uh, in a way example of physical modeling where all features of uh, prototype or full scale structure in the field being studied are reproduced at a uh, you know uh, at a full scale. Uh, usually uh, the full scale models are full scale uh, or full prototype which is uh, you know at 1 is to 1 uh, scale is usually associated with performance of testing of complete geotechnical systems and can be used for use real geotechnical materials. So the need of theoretical model of their behavior uh, disappears and uh, because as we are using the real uh, geotechnical materials the need of theoretical modeling of these materials disappears and provide uh, data for validation of analytical modeling approaches and can thus provide a basis for extrapolation of physical model to the geotechnical prototype. So with that you know there is a possibility that providing data for validation of analytical numerical modeling and approaches which we have discussed earlier and can thus provide a basis for extrapolation of the physical model to the geotechnical prototype. And uh, another uh, added advantage is that instrumentation and, uh, and monitoring geotechnical prototype can itself is a physical model uh, serving this uh, validation purpose. So by instrumenting the you know the physical model and monitoring the geotechnical prototype itself uh, be a physical uh, model serving this validation purpose. So full scale testing is usually performed to evaluate the geotechnical process which is which it is believed may be so dependent on the uh, details of uh, actual soil fabric that is imperative to use real soils. So for example in some type of problems like embankment construction and soft soil wherein uh, in order to monitor the you know the degree of uh, ground improvement for example for a uh, preloading of a soil in order to do that you actually need to do the uh, you know uh, construct the embankment in uh, let us say if suppose if the embankment is of 7.5 meters height above the soft soil and it has to be done in uh, three stages let us say uh, and then between each stage there should be a waiting period of a certain way, uh, period let us say two months or three months uh, and uh, uh, with that uh, in order to you know a set time uh, the you know time of time of time for uh, you know increasing next stage and uh, going for next stage and all one need to do the instrumentation wherein you measure the settlements you measure the water pressure or pore water pressure changes in the soil based on that above we can actually decide about uh, you know the uh, about uh, the uh, this thing. So here uh, the full scale testing is imperative with uh, real soil fabric conditions 
and uh, similarly when we are actually try to accelerate we try to use the uh, you know the drains like uh, p propagated vertical drains or sand drains so in a way uh, what will happen is that we wanted to know the influence of spacing of the drains and uh, you know the installation uh, effects on the performance and all one need to you know uh, monitor and uh, you know these uh, full scale testing so full scale testing is uh, usually performed to evaluate the geodynamical processes which it is believed may be so dependent on the uh, detail of actual soil fabric that is imperative to use at uh, use real soils uh, the so we can uh, put the you know advantages uh, of the full scale modeling are working with real ground conditions and real soils and real loads and real stress levels and real stress histories this is very important particularly for when we are referring to uh, soft clay uh, history whether it is normally consolidated soil or war consolidated soil and uh, so this uh, you know these conditions uh, you know are uh, uh, you know very very uh, relevant and uh, that is the benefit of uh, you know the doing a full scale model test but uh, you know we have uh, you know number of uh, types of structures as well as all these types of structures are subjected to different types of loadings so many times uh, you know simulation of these structures to uh, climatic uh, forces like uh, say rainfall or earthquake and all those things were very very difficult so these uh, you know uh, sim simulation of uh, you know construction of a structure and waiting for uh, uh, you know a certain uh, destructive force to come is uh, you know uh, difficult and uh, uh, next to possible so these are the you know in the right hand side here uh, uh, it has been whatever we have discussed in the previous slide as actually shown here uh, that is the trail embankments wherein uh, the evaluate the process of ground improvement we tend to do the full scale testing or a full scale uh, prototype uh, behavior and use of different types of drains and spacing whether they are adequate or not whether the functionality is okay or not can be have to be checked by monitoring only and uh, disadvantage is in the sense that uh, uh, smaller scale model leads to much more rapid results purely because of the smaller size smaller the size the length required uh, are small physical dimensions are small uh, amount, the amount of the requirement of material will be small so uh, you know the small scale model leads to much more uh, rapid results purely because of smaller size uh, construction of an embankment on soft soils and uh, you know the stage construction for example if you look into it may take years to complete so that situation you know uh, you know is uh, you know not advantages as far as uh, you know full scale uh, uh, or model physical model testing in uh, uh, geotechnical engineering and the cost will increase uh, with the scale of the modeling that means that if you are having uh, you know let us say uh, you know one is to one scale it will be you know almost equivalent to the scale which is actually the you know the the cost will be equivalent to that of in the field and difficult to perform uh, parametric study and uh, difficult to perform uh, you know controlled uh, uh, you know full scale testing in and uh, many times uh, you know with uh, even with a lot of precautions the instrumentation and monitoring is also difficult but if you are able to achieve an appropriate uh, instrumentation and monitoring and if you are able to you know uh, do it with uh, you know uh, in a controlled way then full scale model testing uh, physical model testing uh, is the you know in uh, uh, you know number one uh, uh, option uh, to you know validate uh, the number of uh, uh, you know different uh, new concepts as far as uh, uh, which can be lead in the to study in the geodynamical engineering or to understand about the behavior of geodynamical structures but uh, you know considering the difficulty of the you know performing uh, uh, you know uh, parametric study and uh, also uh, involving the construction of the the cost aspects as well as the fees feasibility aspects uh, you know the small scale modeling turns out to be a preferable option the small scale option in the sense that the model which is not uh, you know uh, tested at 1 is to 1 which is uh, nothing but a reduced by a dimension n that is n is nothing but a scale factor by which the model is reduced. So if you look into the physical models at small scale the key question concerned is uh, you know with establishing the validity of the models whatever we have scaled down 
uh, and ensuring the secured route to the extrapolation from the model behavior to the behavior we could expect at full scale. So the question uh, which is required to be established is the uh, you know validity of the models and ensuring the secured route to, to extrapolation from the model behavior to the behavior uh, the uh, you know we could actually expect at full scale. So uh, you know uh, when we actually test the model at full scale uh, you know we do not have these questions because we are actually doing it one is to one with real soils real ground conditions and real stress histories and real loads and all. But when we do this at uh, you know scale which is different from a full scale which is smaller than uh, you know by, by smaller by a factor n the extrapolation from the, uh, the model behavior is a very important aspect to be considered. So existence of, existence of the supporting theoretical models is thus even more important for interpretation of small scale physical models than for the full scale uh, models. So existence of uh, supporting theoretical models is uh, thus more important uh, for interpretation of small scale uh, physical models than for full scale models. So physical models at small scale uh, you know if you look into the uh, at merits you can say the greater advantage of small scale laboratory model is that we have full control over the all details of the model that means that all aspects of the models under control in the sense that homogeneity uh, you know uh, or uh, some requirement of the small quantity of soil and drainage paths if at all water is actually flowing the sh are short so the test durations will be maybe short possibility exist in uh, performing uh, possibility uh, exists in, in performing many tests and perform, uh, performing uh, with the para parametric variation is possible that means that parametric, uh, very, uh, parametric study is possible and uh, effect of varying key parameters can be considered and another important aspect is that the smaller the scale the cost will be low. So liberty in choosing the boundary and loading conditions of the model this is another important aspect wherein uh, we can actually have uh, you know we get the liberty in choosing the boundary and loading conditions and smaller quantities of soil and drainage paths will be short so the test durations will be smart and uh, but uh, so we can look into this the size of the model is uh, you know as advantages as well as the disadvantage it is not that you know we reduce by uh, you know by greater factor n and uh, say that we have done a small scale models always it is important for us to see that the whatever the small scale model is done is relevant uh, as far as the particular phenomenon is being tested and uh, see that these uh, results represent the full scale response of a respective full scale structure. So the physical model plays a fundamental role in the development of uh, geotechnical understanding and it is per, uh, you know performed basically to validate theoretical and empirical hypothesis and uh, also uh, is done to validate uh, you know uh, you know see, see new phenomenon or you know to perform uh, understand the behavior of the prototypes uh, this is uh, you know uh, is the you know fund, this is the fundamental role in developing the uh, it plays a fundamental role in development of geotechnical understanding and uh, this uh, physical model testing as far as uh, uh, in the laboratory is concerned uh, this is uh, we, we actually have two standard examples one is uh, Casagrande's liquid limit test and the other one is triaxial compression test. So let us look into the Casagrande's uh, cup test in which what we do is that we uh, put a uh, you know make a soil pad. Uh, in a cup which is actually having certain curvature and uh, it is placed on a uh, you know uh, a, a standard uh, you know base and uh, it is subjected to once that uh, pad is actually formed by using the Casagrande's tool what we do is that we separate and make uh, you know two equal slopes at a formed at a you know this pad which was actually formed at a, a defined water content. And then uh, the tool is uh, you know Casagrande's tool separates the uh, two slopes at the toe by a distance uh, 2 mm and uh, the height of this uh, slope is about 8 mm and uh, what uh, we actually do is that you give uh, by giving a tamping energy to the uh, to you know this particular uh, two separated portions uh, we see that. Uh, the water content at uh, you know the blows the number of blows at which you know these two uh, you know uh, separated uh, slopes uh, you know uh, get close uh, 
by about uh, you know over a length of uh, 13 mm and we say that you know there then we can say that uh, you know that is uh, that uh, critical number of blows for that uh, uh, water content. So uh, here what we are doing is that the slope height is 8 mm and uh, uh, the slope inclination is about 60.6 degrees also at both the uh, both the sides and uh, this is subjected to certain sort of damping energy and uh, the, the you know indication of this uh, slopes moving close that means that internally there is a, a failure which actually happens a as we can say that a critical subsurface failure which actually mobilizes makes the slopes to move closer uh, at the toe and uh, you know then we can say that that is the point at which uh, we take the uh, a number of uh, the number of blows required to you know see that this portion uh, closed by about uh, 13 mm. So uh, you know this uh, in this what we are doing is that uh, literally this is a type of a physical model test which we are doing knowingly or unknowingly in order to arrive at the liquid limit of a given soil by Cassegrain Day's cup test and similar example is the triaxial compression test what we do is that here if you are having uh, let us say a sample which is uh, collected at a certain depth and the sample before uh, its uh, collection is subjected to uh, vertical stress and horizontal stress at elastic equilibrium the relationship between uh, uh, vertical stress and horizontal stress is say sigma h is equal to k sigma v basically for normally consolidated soils uh, you know where uh, k h uh, k which is the uh, coefficient of at pressure rest will be equal to 0.5. So in that case uh, sigma v is equal to point, uh, you know sigma h is equal to 0.5 times so sigma v and uh, moreover uh, upon this when it is subjected to loading that is the increase in loading what uh, you know the sample at a particular level is subjected. So this is simulated in the triaxial uh, compression test in order to understand uh, the strength parameters of soil what we do is that here the sample is subjected to a shear by applying the increase in load that is nothing but what we call. So this is simulated here what you can see is that this confining stresses are simulated by using uh, the water surrounding the water placed in the triaxial cell and the deviator load which is actually applied that is nothing but the additional load sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3 plus p by a. So sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is nothing but the deviator load is equal to p by a which is applied basically to c arrive at the deviator stress at the failure. So with that what we are getting is that the stress strain behavior of a soil and so that we can actually get the, the stress strain response of a soil to the given loading. So this is a what we can say is the first uh, you know physical model test which uh, done in the laboratory to simulate the field uh, or real situation condition. So coming to if the physical models what we have discussed is that the physical model can be done at uh, 1 is to 1 or uh, 1 is to n. If the model is not constructed at 1 is to 1 scale that means that we need to have some idea uh, about the way in which we should extrapolate the observations that means that if the model is not constructed at 1 is to 1 uh, we need to understand about how these uh, the model which is not tested at 1 is to 1 but it is tested at 1 is to n let us say reduced by n times how this model actually corresponds to a model which is uh, you know uh, which is uh, should be at 1 is to 1. So the material behavior particularly if you look into this we have uh, two categories one is linear and homogeneous for the loads applied in the model the other one is the non-linear if the geodetical structure possesses several materials which interact with each other. So in the second category what we see here non-linear and if the if the geodetical structure possesses several materials which will interact with each other. So in this case like you know for example example for this is that let us say that we have got a cable is placed between you know two supports and let us say you know the cable is loaded at the center with let us say by load w. So here what we can say is that the span of the cable is say length l between two supports and by loading the cable undergoes a deflection by h. So in this situation what will happen is that the cable uh, you know the deflects or sacks by h in the center. So here uh, if you wanted to get the relationship between uh, 
uh, you know P which is the tension and weight of the cable uh, and then relationship between uh, H the central deflection and uh, you know uh, the span can be obtained. So here details of model can be projectable to a prototype stays uh, you know uh, but you know here in this case uh, basically P by W which is nothing but the tension and weight of the cable to the H by L. H by L is nothing but H is the you know deflection and L is the span. For example, if I wanted to project these results to something like you know P by W is a function of H by L now, where we can actually get P1 by W1 and H1 by L1, P2 by W2 and H1 by L2, so H2 by L2. So in the ways what will happen is that we will be able to do and postulate from one model to other model easily without much uh, you know uh, uh, you know moderation about the scale factors. Uh, are scale issues, but if you are having a situation of uh, non-linear or if the geotechnical structure uh, possesses several materials which interact with each other, then you know what we need to know is that uh, we require an understanding about the dimensional analysis and development of the scaling relationship. Because particularly we have a number of phenomena in geotechnical engineering. Let us say that we have got uh, you know self weight forces. These are nothing but these body forces. So we actually have two types of forces. One is called body forces, and other one is uh, you know uh, you know uh, the surface forces or contact forces. Because basically, body forces are you know examples for body forces are nothing but weight forces uh, due to sulphate of the soil or you know seepage uh, when the water flows to the soil. Uh, the forces exerted by the flowing water onto the grains is nothing but a seepage forces in the process of dissipation of energy. This happens. So the seepage forces and uh, you know uh, sulphate forces are regarded as uh, you know body forces and uh, when we material interacting with each uh, another material then the contact forces are actually developed. So uh, but when the body is subjected to forces then it is subjected to stresses and uh, if the body is uh, you know a bo you know deformable body then body undergoes uh, you know a change in length then it is subjected to strains. And because of this, this change in lengths can also undergo, or the strains can also be undergo, uh, undergone by collapse of the particles, or by you know breaking of the particles, or crushing of the particles. So this uh, you know this uh, particular uh, you know uh, emphasis what actually requires is that in understanding of this dimension analysis. So dimension analysis is a technique which is actually used. Uh, uh, traditionally in civil engineering and which can be applied to geotechnical engineering to understand about the uh, you know the several relationship between uh, parameters which are actually descri describing a particular phenomenon that means that we will be having a, uh, a certain main important uh, variable and then it is actually influenced by several uh, variables which are called as independent uh, variables. So relationship between dependent variable and independent variables can be obtained by dimensional analysis and from there the similitude or similarity theories can be applied to deduce the scaling relationships. This is one of the ways of deducing then we also have by using the concept of uh, you know the, the differential equations or equations governing the phenomenon we can also deduce the scaling relationships.